Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to actually do digital. I said last week I wasn't, but I changed my mind. So yeah, Digital Equipment Corporation has been around for quite some time. Uh, but the first thing I want to talk about is the logo. So you'll notice that it is a white text on a red background. That became official later. The original was a white text on either a black or a blue background, but for some reason they decided to go to red. That may have been because of the, the uh, buyout by Compaq. But so let's talk about the company itself. So DEC was founded in 1957 by Ken Olson and Harlan Anderson. Both of these two were working at MIT Lincoln Labs, and they were developing new ways of, of looking at computing, and they were interested in trying to reduce the cost. It's always important that if you're going to try to survive against a major competitor like IBM, that you find a niche for yourself and be able to offer a computer that, they, that IBM can't respond to. And so that's what they set out to do. Then the first computer that they actually released was the TXO, uh, but it, I don't know if, I'm, if, if I would really count that as one. It wasn't a standalone device. It wasn't what we would consider a complete computer. It was pieces of it. And it was used to help, you know, understand and do research and figure out different things. So I'm not trying to detract from the TXO. I'm not going to talk about it. I want to talk about the first computer that they actually invented. And so the PDP-1 was first, and Ben Gurley invented it in 1959. And that ushered in the hacker era. Unfortunately, uh, Ben Gurley didn't live much longer beyond 59. I'm not sure the exact year, but it was in the early 60s. A disgruntled employee killed him. Sad that the, they had such a loss because he was brilliant. As you can see, the machine uh, had a number of parts in the back, and then it had this console, uh, which was a graphics uh, user interface, as well as a input device, which was an IBM Selectric, that they had interfaced to the computer. Now, that's not the one with the round ball. That's one of the previous models. One of the, one of the things that PDP-1 did first was they were the first mini computer that had a game, and that game was called Space War. It was quite well known, and it was funny. <laughs> I remember seeing this running on PDP-8s and PDP-11s, uh, it, so it lasted quite a long time, and they kept enhancing it. In the more business side, they also had TJ02, uh, or TJ2, I should say. TJ2 was a word processing application. Now, it didn't have all the bells and whistles of a modern-day word processing, but there wasn't anything like this at the time. So as you can see, it had headers, and it had paragraphs, and you could block things up. It could also do things like bullet points and quite advanced for its time. I mean, you had to have typesetting uh, programs or type, you had to go to a typesetter if you wanted to have all that fancy stuff. So they were they had their uh, TJ2, which was, it was, yeah, monumental to say the least. They also had the first interactive debugger uh, and a credible chess program that wasn't the first. And there has been, every, that's one of the first things that anybody does on a new machine is it's like graphics and doing a teapot uh, render no, it's it's uh, the first program you write for a, a new machine is the chess program. So, yeah, they had one too, and it was a very good one. Uh, BBN had begun working on their time sharing operating system TXO, I think it was called or TSO, but uh, it wasn't real. I don't think it was released on the PDP one. I think it came later, but they did some of their early development work on the PDP one, and the PDP one just didn't have enough memory to have to be a time sharing system but so DEC built the PDP-1 as a single address single instruction stored program computer it did have magnetic core memory and it did offer full parallel processing so quite advanced for its time very advanced for its time uh, you know, you're probably going to laugh I mean a PDP-1 had a computational rate of about mm, 100,000 addi uh, additions per second which yeah, that doesn't quite hold up today, does it? But it was twice as fast as many of the computers that were around at the time, including mainframes. So, yeah, it was no slouch. It was no for its time. But what DEC wanted to do was they they wanted to offer a different model of the machine at a lower price that would address 
the types of capabilities that someone interested in building a process controller uh, would need in a computer that didn't want everything that the PDP-1 had. They were similar, but they weren't exactly the same. Uh, and the PDP-4 could run applications that were written for the PDP-1, but it did it at, at a much slower rate. And I found this design document that talked about that it was actually purposely built to run applications at about five-eighths the performance of the PDP-1. Uh, it's kind of weird. I mean, you would think that what we do today is we're always trying to push faster and faster machines, but in order for this one to get into the hands of the people that wanted process controllers, they had to drop the price significantly. Well, to do that, they had to scale back the performance. So that's what they did, and it cost about half as much as the PDP-1. But unfortunately, there was only about 54 of them sold. So yeah, the market was like, I'm going to buy what? <laughs> I'm going to buy a slower machine? Uh, don't think so. So the PDP-7 was announced in 1964 and was released the following year in 65. Its claim to fame was Flipchip. Uh, Flipchip was a trademark technology that was co-developed by DEC and some other company. I don't know that remember the name of them, but I'm sure if you dig, you could probably find it. Uh, but that was a method of interconnecting semiconductor chips together so that they would operate uh, as one unit. And, uh, and of course, that was necessary if you were going to try to integrate a number of those uh, ICs together to be able to form a computer. And Flipchip was one of the technologies that allowed that to happen. The other thing that was famous about the PDP-7 is that Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie began their work developing Unix on the PDP-7. Uh, the, the legend is that, I, I don't know if it was Ken, I think it was Ken that was walking down the hallway and they saw one just sitting there that wasn't being used and they kind of, they I don't know if they asked around, they might have asked around a little bit, but they just kind of grabbed it and took it and nobody said anything, so they started working on, Ken wanted to write a game, get a game ported over to it uh, and uh, and as he did that, they had been on the Multics project, and they thought, well, you know, we've got all this knowledge. Maybe we should put it to use and try to develop a, a, an operating system for this platform. So they began working on Unix. Now, in those days, it was written in Assembler. So most of it was written in Assembler because B and C hadn't been invented yet. So a year later, uh, DEC released the PDP-8. I used to, I remember seeing some of these, some of them were disconnected, some of them were still in use, but it was the first successful commercial computer uh, in the mini computer line. So it was known, the base model was known as the straight eight, and there was a number of eights that were around, all, this, all the straight eight meant was that it was a base configuration, so yeah, you didn't have tape drives and disk drives and all that stuff on it, it, it just had enough to get you started which was probably pretty good. I remember seeing some in the physics lab and I remember seeing some hooked up to some of the supercomputers uh, being used as input devices to ingest data into it and then output devices to pull data back out to visualize it onto the screen. Uh, the other one that came about was the PDP-11. That's probably the best known of DEX mini computers and those that arrived in 1970. Some of the models of the PDP-11 integra had integrated uh, uh, large-scale integration CPUs, but it wasn't in all the models. I also remember seeing a bunch of these around, uh, and they were all actively in use at that time. I mean, nobody was going to let you have just go grab one and just walk off with it. So, yeah, uh, they were pretty prized. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, but the PDP was popular with programmers because it had... The C language it had been ported over to the PDP 11 so yeah a lot of people were, were programming on it that you would also see it running statistical programs like SPSS and so forth uh, the terminals with graphics displays were more popular on deck than they were on IBM because IBM didn't really have one so you would you would find a lot of graphics uh, terminals hooked up to these machines uh, because it was just easier to interface them into this than a mainframe. I do want to talk a little bit about the predecessor to this one, the BAX 1170. So um, in the year that the 1170 was announced, Ken Thompson took a year off as a sabbatical 
from AT&T Bell Labs and went out to the University of California at Berkeley. I think he was trying to finish up some of his classwork, but while he was there, the BSD team was moving their Unix onto the 1170. And so he ended up helping with that and got that up and running. Uh, but the 11780 was released in about 1978. It was best known for running Ultrix or Unix on the system. Uh, I remember that I remember seeing one version on a university campus that was running BSD Unix and another version of it that was running Ultrix. But this machine had hardware specs that wouldn't arrive on the PC for 10 years. And that's just what it takes. But, you know, the one thing that never arrived on the PC was the ability to handle the number of users that that machine could handle. It could easily handle between 30 and 40 users. Whereas I remember some of the PC servers at the time now, this is using the large network cable that were, I think it was one megabit uh, in speed. But the best you probably could do on a PC server that was actually executing applications uh, maybe eight, maybe 10. I remember seeing a couple that did 12, but yeah, it, it didn't go much higher than that. It just didn't have the uh, bandwidth support for the underlying infrastructure to support any much, many more users than that. And even then, it had trouble staying you know, up. But the VAX 11780 ran at, at about the same speed as the IBM 360. So I'm raising my eyebrow. This is a, that's a million instructions per second on a machine that costs a tenth of what the uh, 360 cost. So you can see that DEC was definitely carving a nice niche for itself out of the IBM market, uh, market share. So, and that term, MIPS, which was millions of instructions per second, became the basis for benchmarks and you'll find even like the uh, byte benchmark and some of those would refer back to a VAX MIP. And they're referring to this machine uh, as the uh, baseline for those as a comparison. So, but the problem with MIPS is, is that it has different meanings depending upon what uh, hardware architecture you're running on because it's you know, millions of instructions per second. I mean, what, how do you do that on a machine that's multi-core, has multi-processors and is able to run things concurrently? Yeah, it just, and some of the instructions could be done in parallel. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, it was just, it wasn't a good means of, of describing a unit of work. DEC preferred to call it a VAX unit of performance or a BUP, although that name never stuck, <laughs> never stuck at all. It was always referred to as a VAX MIP. So, <laughs> Ken Olson of DEC, uh, the CEO, he was very vocal about the future computers. Allegedly, this is what uh, this is what the press said, and this still pervades today. I still see the same thing. It's still out there, uh, and I think it's because if you consider what they said that he, he said, it's funny. But if but if you realize that what he actually meant wasn't the same. Uh, so anyway, the, as the story goes, when he was asked what he thought of the new personal computers, he said there is no reason for any individual to have a computer in his home. Now. Ken Olson always, if you would ask him about that, he would say, oh, well, no, 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 they took me out of context. That's not what I was talking about. We were having a discussion about home control systems, and he didn't think the PC was up to the task of being a home control device. And for the time, he was absolutely right. No way. I mean, this was before the X10 controllers, and yeah, they're, they're, so yeah, it was pretty bad. It was, <laughs> it was really bad. So yeah, he was right about that uh, for the time period. But yeah, but it still it sticks with them as because it is funnier to consider it that yeah, what he was really saying. No, you shouldn't have one at home. You don't need one. Uh, but that's not what he meant, uh, and I believe that uh, Ken Olson in 1987 in a public appearance. Now this is true. He did say this. He referred to Unix as snake oil. Well, you can imagine the Unix community was like, oh my God, how could you say that? But he believed that VMS was a superior operating system. But, you know, in all honesty, he did encourage development of a BSD Unix called Ultrix. However, it never got any traction inside a deck. You know, when you have an engineering firm, what happens is, is that engineering firm develops this thing called not invented here syndrome. 
you know, if, if they didn't make it and they didn't build it, they're going to be like, oh, well, we didn't do this. I mean, pfft, it's probably a piece of junk. And uh, so, yeah, it never, it never took off. Although you would find Ultrix available on those systems. And the Berkeley folks also made their version of Unix available on the, on the deck platforms as well, of course. Uh, and AT&T Unix also ran on the DEC platforms because it was natively developed there. One of the interesting things that happened to DEC was by the 1990s, the mini computer market was collapsing. I mean, it was just nose diving. And the reason for that was the, the PC and the PC workstation. Those were attracting uses in business. And because of its lower cost, it was more uh, likely to be accepted than buying a mini computer. So what did DEC do? They were working on going the opposite way. They were building the VAX 9000, which is shown here. That's a mainframe based machine. So now we're going upscale and the market is pushing to go downscale. DEC took a, yeah, they just went right and fell right off the cliff. Uh, so as you might think, the VAX 9000 was a massive failure and the amount of, and the amount of money invested in it was horrendous and they never recouped any of it and that was the beginning of their demise uh, but they did launch a they did have a successful launch for their alpha line in the mid 1990s it was the first exploration into reduced instruction sets for DEC uh, or risk computing so this moved DEC out of the poorly selling mini computer market and into the microprocessing market but uh, it and it well, I should say not, but but it ran many different operating systems, and those were Open VMS. And by the way, v, uh, 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 Olson did make uh, VMS open, so anyone could get the source code, recompile it for whatever architecture you wanted to put it on. There was also Unix, of course. Windows NT was done, and uh, Dave Cutler, who who was the uh, author of Windows NT, had actually been. A, a, a lead for the development of VMS and Open VMS while at DEC. So he was very, uh, very uh, knowledgeable about how advanced operating systems were built. And then he took that knowledge over and developed Windows NT. Uh, from the Linux uh, landscape, you had Debian, SUSE, Gentoo, and Red Hat. Uh, BSD had NetBSD, OpenBSD, and FreeBSD up to version 6. There was also Plan 9 from Battle Labs, which was it stayed kind of in an experimental stage, never really actually went into a release stage. And then there was Laka Passet Pistachio, or L4KA, if you prefer, which was uh, a, 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 a way ahead of its time as an operating system, although you, you probably have to go read about it because it's you won't find any places running it. But not only did the Alpha run on the server side, it also ran on the workstation side. So it, it was very successful, but unfortunately it came too, too late to save DEC. Uh, they had sold, DEC had sold off one of their micro, uh, microprocessor development divisions to Intel for something like $1.4 billion. And even that wasn't enough to float DEC. Uh, for any length of time. And so they, as they kept sinking, they finally had no choice but to sell the Compaq for about $9.8 billion. Now, Compaq didn't know, DEC had a huge market in Europe uh, and also international, and, and Compaq had no clue how to do that. Most of their business was in the U.S. and Canada uh, at the time. So... <laughs> Compaq kind of it took this this dinosaur basically, and they started to sink with it. So in 2002, Compaq merged with HP. HP had a clue; they knew how to manage those markets, uh, and they integrated that technology into the design of their products and their future products. And yeah, and they were successful with it. I would think. I would think yeah, that people would consider that successful. So, DEC at this point was gone. At all for all purposes, it was gone. But one of the things that DEC did before they sold out was they had worked on, first of all, they were the first site to uh, be on the internet. They were one of the first companies to have a website on the internet. 
and uh, I think it was it was deck.com. Don't go out there. It's not it's not that now. Somebody has taken over that IP to, that uh, domain name. So uh, it is obviously not a deck enthusiast site. But uh, they launched Alta Vista in 1995. It was one of the first search engines for the internet. It was also very successful. It received about 300,000 hits. Now, if you don't know what a hit is, that a hit was counted any time you made a request for anything on the on the on the HTTP server and got a response back. So that could include graphics, or sub pages, or whatever, or even you know what. It received about 300,000 hits on the first day, and that grew over to 800 million hits every day and that happened within two years so i would say successful but <laughs> alta vista even though they outlived deck they were sold finally in 2003 to yahoo and by 2013 alta vista disappeared from the internet uh, without a trace so yeah they're gone i think probably that wrap this up let's talk about some final thoughts here so deck made some long-lasting impressions almost every aspect of computing from the computers to operating systems to hardware design to software to chips even the internet itself and, I, and in all honesty i wonder if we would be as far along on the internet today if it hadn't been for digital advances that they had made and the fact that they were pioneers in the business use of the internet so, and the, shown here is the rainbow. They finally caved in and built a PC, but again, it was right at the end when they did this. So, but yeah, the rainbow PC was right at the end. So, of course, Compaq took that over. So, I guess the big question remains, what if DEC had moved to microcomputing earlier? Could they have survived? Could they have made it past all these bad things that had happened? Uh, could they have survived their blunder with the VAX 9000? So the company was late really in recognizing the popularity of the what we would call the uh, open systems or the desktop PC and the desktop workstation for use in business. They just... I, I don't know if they were just blinded by it. They, they, they probably, you know, maybe it was the same kind of uh, response that some of the other companies had to it. Well, it's just toys, right? Um, but DEC resisted that market move away from closed systems because uh, to open systems. Because, again, not invented here syndrome. So, and that included PCs that were powered by Intel uh, uh, microprocessors as well as generic servers running Unix. So that cost them. Now I'm not talking open source systems is not the same as open source. Open systems refers to I can put together a platform on a, on a using standard technology from AMD, Intel, or even the risk-based processors and run a standard operating system on it. So they they just were they just refused to budge and yeah and their sink and their their uh, ship sunk. One of the early employees, one of the earliest employees for DEC was Gordon Bell. He was a hardware designer. He designed a lot of the early PDP machines after the death of Ben Gurley. But I think it can be summed up best by one of the quotes that he said. So the computers we built are of a cost and size that brought down computing to a level. And, and what did he mean by that? What, what do you mean by moving it down to a level? So consider mainframes, which were, you know, those were in the half a million dollars to a million dollars and up uh, range of computing in order to get it into your data center. Now, that would just be the purchase of the hardware. That wouldn't include things like power, air, maintenance, you know, getting the cables <laughs> and getting it hooked up. But that would just be purchasing the hardware to put it in your main, your uh, data center. Now, what... DEC had always wanted to do was to bring that cost down by a tenth. So that was their goal to provide hardware and machines that would be at the same level of performance at a tenth of the cost. Very disruptive, right? So we saw that again in the early 80s, late 70s, when uh, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs took it down another level to the microprocessor level. And again, 
about a tenth again of the price. So about, I mean, they were $2,400 for uh, an Apple II, but then by the time you outfitted it with disk and all that stuff, you're probably looking at closer to $3,500 in a printer, maybe another maybe another 800. So, yeah, but so you got it to that point. And then Windows, same thing, Microsoft MS-DOS, you had machines in the $2,000 to $5,000 range that would meet the need for that. So, and then we saw it repeat in the early 2000s with moving down to the nanoprocessors, like what well, that's what I call them, <clears throat> like ARM, and those would be the cell phone technology that brought down the cost. Now, the cost is rising again, but uh, it brought down the cost of computing again to a new level of a few, uh, maybe it started out mm, $350 for an iOS device. And then now today you have prices of phones that run from that price range all the way up to two grand, something like that. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that is disruptive, very disruptive of the market. Where it'll go from here, I think that maybe one of you might do that. Maybe, maybe, I don't have any idea what it'll be but maybe one of you will be the ones that invent it. And I hope that happens. That's kind of where I want to end things today. I, I, I don't intend to do one about IBM. There are so many sites that talk about all of IBM's greatness. But I will leave you with a quote that Ken Olson said, and this is probably true. He said that, and I'm gonna paraphrase it, but basically he said that for every new technology and every new advancement, if you do enough research, you'll find somebody had already done it first. So, I mean, if you look at what IBM claims that they have invented and then you look at the history, you may find other vendors in that, in that space that were actually there 10 years, five years ahead of IBM. DEC's strength in this time frame was the fact that they could do what IBM was doing for much less. So, and that was, that was the reason why they accelerated uh, to their peak, I think their peak was uh, probably about the 1980s. But as the the PCs progressed, they started to erode the mini computer uh, market. And it's funny that a company that was based on disruptive technologies to the mainframe to, couldn't recognize that here's another disruptive uh, technology that was going to get them. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video today. If you did, please like and subscribe. Hope to see you all again soon. Bye for now.